Hi, welcome to the next in our series on design. If you look at this conception of design, we've talked about it before, it's a spiral. It has seven parts. It starts with research, then going into taking an idea and decomposing into parts that are small enough to deal with, modeling those parts so you can figure something about it, out about them, um, implementing some kind of solution, measuring to see if that solution works, and finally communicating the re results before you get back again into research. And it's research that we want to talk about today. What is research? What does it consist of? Because the truth of every single one of these steps of the process of design is the step itself is a process. Research is a process. Decomposition of an idea is a process. And we're going to learn the process of research today. So to talk about the process of research, I'm drawing off of a very famous book. It's sort of a classic in the field called The Craft of Research by Booth, Colum, and Williams. And although it's not really written for engineering, the idea of research cuts across many, many disciplines. And this is a very general conception. So the research cycle starts with basically a practical problem. You have to ask yourself, what's the problem I'm solving? Why is it practical? Why do I need to know the answer? The practical problem motivates, essentially, a research question. And this research question, I think, is the most critical part of research. If you go in and try to research things generally without asking a specific question you're trying to answer, you soon get bogged down in this giant morass or swamp of all this information that's semi-related to what you're doing. And it's very easy to get lost in this massive amount of information. Keeping focused on a question helps you avoid this problem. The research question, in turn, defines a research project. And the project is really what we're talking about when you get in and you're actually doing the research, reading, taking notes, comparing what you learn. After you complete the project, it leads essentially to a result or answer. You find out something. You're able to make a judgment. You evaluate something from the result of your research. And this, in turn, helps to solve that practical problem. So it's a cyclical thing. If you had a practical problem, chose a good research question, did your research project the right way, you'll come up with a result or answer that's going to be actionable. It's going to help you to solve that practical problem. And again, I'm going through this very briefly, but it's all laid out in this excellent book called The Craft of Research, which I think is in its third edition now. What I'm going to do now is briefly talk about two different types of research. The first reach type of research is probably what you think of when you hear the word research, and that is research to explore something. This essentially means you're finding out new information. So what does this mean? It essentially expands the solution space in your design problem. By doing research, you learn about things you didn't know before. So you're expanding your solution space, allowing more divergent thinking. It also lets you build off of the work of others. As Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further than others, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And research is the way you stand on the shoulders of giants and build off of their work. We never do everything alone. Research helps you discover the boundaries of your own knowledge and it expands them. You find out what you know and what you don't know. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. It helps you find better, easier, cheaper, safer, you fill in the word there, of ways to accomplish the project goals. It really sort of lets you know more and know better ways to do things. Research distinguishes novice from expert designers. And what we know from watching people who are good designers and people who are new at design is that people who are really good design spend a lot more time doing research and exploring a problem space through research than novices do. The reason for this is very simple. It's very cost and time effective to do research compared with going out and trying to do things on your own or explore or experiment by building something and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. If you can learn through reading the mistakes of others, it's a very, very efficient process. Finally, it helps you better estimate the time, effort, and cost of a project. Research is really a very effective management tool when you have to make estimates and plan a project. And I think really the most important thing that research does is research is what I will, would call a good or a virtue. Um, really, it helps you avoid the cardinal sin of engineering, which is the sin of hubris. Now, hubris is an ancient Greek term uh, which you can think of as excessive pride. Excessive pride generally in your own knowledge or your own abilities. And it's cited as a common tragic flaw in ancient Greek literature. And it's a more modern term too. We don't use the word so much today. 
But quoting from Tolkien's The Two Towers from his trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, he quotes, Alas for Saruman, it was his downfall as I now perceive. Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. And this is really true in engineering. If you go and do something without fully understanding it through research, you're guilty of the sin of hubris. And it can result in really tragic things happening because you can't see all the consequences of your action. So the way I think about this is that there's a very small amount or a very small area of what you actually know. Of all the things that are known, what you know is a very, very tiny part. A slightly larger but still small part is what you know you don't know. You've heard about something, but you really don't know about it. And you'll admit that lack of knowledge to yourself if you won't admit it to other people. The biggest space, though, of knowledge is the things you don't know you don't know. And this is a really dangerous area because it's what you don't know you don't know that leads to hubris, which leads to bad assumptions and bad decisions, and can really, in engineering, cause very, very tragic decisions to be made. And so really one of the goals of research is to sh basically grow the red space a little bit, but this is hard, to dramatically grow the blue space and to slightly shrink the green space. And you're only going to shrink it slightly because it's so big. But research really helps you move out of the space of things you don't know and at least give you some humility, the opposite of hubris. And that's one type of research, research to explore and research to learn. There's another type of research as well, and that's research to eliminate ideas. And this is a very, very hard type of research to find. If you're doing research to explore or discover something, it's very good to talk about that. But the mistakes you've made, the failures you've had, um, are very, very difficult to find, um, especially if there are others, because people don't like to, to write about it. But one thing you can do in research is help eliminate bad possibilities in design. So let's see how that works. So in order to explain this, I'm going to start off with sort of a binary decision tree. Let's begin at the red point here. And we'll say essentially that we have two possible decisions that we need to make in terms of thinking through a research project or doing a design. Uh, the black choice is the path we take. The white choice is the one we choose not to take. So at this first decision point, we have two possibilities. However, this decision point leads to another decision point. Here, we have a total of four possibilities. We choose, again, the upward path leading to the black dot. But if you look at all the possible possibilities we could have made, there are four of them at this step. And you can easily see as we move forward, and I'm not going to write down all the circles here because it would get very crowded, that at the third decision point, there are eight possible choices. At the fourth, there are 16, 32, 64, 256. And so finally, after we've made 10 decisions, if each of those decisions was binary, choice A or choice B, we would have selected one from over a 1,000 possible choices. Now, if you're not an expert, if these choices aren't at all obvious, if choice A or choice B could lead potentially to equally good designs or designs that are equally good in different contexts, you have an immense amount of space to explore, a very, very divergent problem. And so the thing research can help you do is to eliminate some of these pathways. Let's see how this works. Let's say in this case you do research. And instead of starting at this first point right here with the red circle, your research lets you find out that there's another starting point, um, that all the initial possibilities you can eliminate down into one best choice because other people have tried them, and everybody pretty much agrees that this is the point to start. If we start at this point, the whole problem changes. Look at what happens. All of that goes away. These numbers all shift over. And now, if we start at this point, instead of there being 1024 possibilities, We've eliminated that down to 64. Research eliminating bad choices really, really narrows down the, the solution space, the space you have to explore. It can save you an immense amount of work if you can find research that helps you eliminate bad possibilities as well as select good possibility. So how do we go about doing this? Again, the process given in the craft of research is, is picking a practical problem, 
one that's actionable, one in which an answer is going to make a difference in something you actually do, picking good research questions, and then undertaking a research project. And a research project is all about finding information, and that's what I want to talk about next. What I've done in this slide is I've created a table. On the top of the table, labeling the columns, I'll write information. On the rows of the table, on the side, I'll write access, by which I mean how you get that information, how you access the information. And you can see the types of information that I've defined, the sources you can go to in your research are books, articles, social, tacit, organizational, commercial. The ways you can access that information are through the internet, even open, either open searches or closed searches, ones you need to have a subscription service such as the library offers, print media, or actually talking with people either by face-to-face -face phone or electronic communication. Now these different types of information sources are going to let you learn different things and you're going to access them in different ways. Some of the best and most reliable information out there is in books because there's a lot of time and effort and expense that goes to printing a book and they, the publishers want people to buy it and people won't buy it if the information isn't correct. It turns out that books can sometimes be accessed in the open internet. Um, most often you're going to find books by going to the library and actually getting a print book. Um, another very good source of information is articles, um, journal articles and white papers, because many of these have been vetted through a process called peer review we're not going to go into. Again, sometimes articles are available in, on the open internet, but you're actually going to have to go in and use a uh, private internet service such as at the library to access many of the journals because they require paid subscriptions. You can also access articles and white papers through print forms. Another type of information is social information. These are groups of people who have collected information um, useful to a particular area, not because they're getting paid for it, many times because they're interested in it. Hobbyist clubs, societies around one thing or another. Astronomy has a lot of these. Uh, these are often available on the open internet because these people like to share what they do. Um, oftentimes you connect through these through face-to-face -face contacts. Uh, sometimes phone calls will help you here. And electronic communication is very, very good for this. Things like a Twitter feed, uh, user groups, email, things like that. Tacit information is information that's not written down anywhere. An example of this, for example, in electrical engineering is building a, a buck boost converter. It turns out that when you build these things on a printed circuit board, um, you get a lot of inductance from the traces, so you have to lay it out very carefully. Now, how careful you have to be, how much you can deviate from things, is something that's really hard to calculate. And you need to learn it from an expert, somebody who's tried it before, who can give you some guidelines. And those guidelines are tacit information. Sometimes you can find this in the open internet through a site like instructables.com. Um, videos on YouTube will sometimes give you some of the tips and tricks on this. Most often, tacit information is acquired in a face-to-face -face manner. Um, organizational information is information about how an organization does something. For example, the, the rubric that you're given in your class on what's expected in a report is an example of organizational information. Um, usually this information is not available to the public, particularly within private companies. Um, you have to get it through face-to-face -face interaction, sometimes phone calls, and not so much electronic communication because people don't like this organizational information to be in a format that is widely available. And the final type of information that's very, very important in design is what I'm going to call commercial information. Things like catalogs from vendors, uh, manufacturers and their websites, information you get from sales reps, data sheets, or application notes uh, from engineering firms. Uh, these are usually because people are advertising available on the open internet. Um, they're often less and less available now in print form. That used to be the dominant form of disseminating these, but with the cost of printing going up, more people are just sticking stuff online. And of course, there are other ways, such as getting these and talking to people face-to-face -face at a company, making phone calls, or emailing people within companies. So I've talked a lot about this slide, but this is actually important because you actually do a research project. Don't limit yourself either to one type of information, such as just uh, commercial information or data sheets, and don't only limit yourself to one form of information, because when you see when you look at this table, if you only go out to the internet 
and use things from home that are available to everybody and the public, um, you don't hit all the types of information well, and you're not going to get a well-rounded picture of what you're doing. So you have to look for different types of information and use different forms of access. So when you go through this research project, what are you going to come up with at the end? It's not like you're going to make something, because research is about information. So the first thing is to accept from the beginning that you're going to forget most of what you learn in research unless you write it down. So one of your deliverables is lots and lots of notes about what you learned. Um, a summary of the research in terms of notes. Make a list of the sources where you found the information, in other words, a bibliography, and correctly format those citations. Uh, a journal or lab book helps very much in research. A team, a group, may want to create a wiki to share information more easily with one another. Um, data sheets and application notes and taking notes on them is a good way to, to collect research. And if you do a lot of research and really understand something in a lot of depth, people will write review articles. Uh, you won't be doing this most likely in your design project, but review articles when you find them are very, very good things to have because they summarize a lot of information that's scattered around a lot of different sources in one place, and can, they can be very, very informative. So this is probably a good place to end. Again, let's end with our conception of design. Design is a spiral that goes through multiple stages. As you get toward the center of the spiral, you're moving more quickly between the sta stages. Research and communicating and implementing and modeling all start to meld together. You're doing these things simultaneously. But it begins with research, and research itself is a process, one that can be learned, one you can get better at and faster at. It's not for everybody. Not everybody likes reading and searching for information, but it's a truly invaluable skill for any engineer.